When someone is a deadly threat to you, you'll be making decisions in split seconds about how to best protect yourself. Welcome to today's active self-protection lesson. I'm your host, John Correa. Today's video comes to us from athens Clark County in Georgia in the United States and it seems like they are getting more and more officer-involved incidents there, unfortunately. This is the second one we've had in a very short time on the channel. Filster is one of my trusted holster makers with great offerings like the floodlight and trauma medical equipment to keep you and your loved ones safe. They're one of the few companies that I trust to make a quality product at a good price, and I thank them for sponsoring today's video. Go read the news stories linked in the description on this one. Police have been called because this woman is acting in an erratic manner. She's waving around a big knife, said she has a gun, and the neighbors are obviously very concerned. I want you to pay attention, number one, to what she's doing with her hands, both hands, and really pay attention to what she says to the officer. We have audio on this one, so let's listen in. 10-4, I think she's flagging me down here. She's got a knife in her hand. 10-4. Put the knife down, please, ma'am. Please. Put the knife down. Put the knife down. Central, send me, central, send me another unit. Put, put it down. Put it down. Put it down. Shots fired, central. Central semi EMS. 10-4. Five, five, I just got back in the car. I'm coming from Denver to the Apache Center. Stay calm. Once backup arrived, the officers tried to give this woman a first aid, but unfortunately she succumbed to her injuries. The review board said that the shooting was justified, and that right there is where this one ends. Some pretty significant stuff and some lessons to learn out of this one. I actually have a question for you that we're gonna have to talk about in the comments out of this one. I'm really strongly considering taking the badge cams and the officer-involved incidents and putting them on their own channel, like ASP badge cams or something like that. It would be more work. It wouldn't be every day of the week. There'd probably be one or two a week. But I'm thinking about segregating the private citizen-involved incidents and the officer-involved incidents. It'd be a lot of work, so let you let me know. Would that be something that you would subscribe to and watch in addition to what you see here? Or what, should we just keep them here? You let me know, and I will listen, and we'll talk about it. All right, let's get some lessons. So the first thing I want to think about here is the difference between officer-involved incidents and private citizen incidents. As private citizens, we'd never be in this particular incident because when we see this woman coming, we'd close our door, we'd lock it, we'd call the cops, outsource our violence, and let them deal with it. But police officers don't have that ability. We actually force them into these kinds of encounters because we force them in order to peace keep, you know, keep peace in the community. So therefore, sometimes the way that they use force is a little different. We have to understand that. Now, notice here that he gets out and he starts issuing commands to this woman. Hey, man, put the knife down. And he does so from a long way away. She's clearly 10, 12, 14 yards away at this point. And so he starts issuing commands to her and telling her, hey, ma'am, I want to talk to you, but I need you to put that knife down or whatever. So again, he can't run away from this encounter. He can't just jump back in the car and drive off. He has to pursue it. So he has to put himself in danger. And of course, we would give an officer the same right to defend himself himself against a deadly threat that we would give any other private citizen about a deadly threat. We certainly wouldn't give him less protection of himself because we forced him into deadly force encounters than we would give to a private citizen. Now, if you were paying attention, she says, I have a knife, I have a gun. I have a knife, I have a gun. And you can see right here that she has her right hand under her shirt making that little pointed gesture that I have a gun. Now, even if you don't believe her and come to find out she didn't have a gun, even if you say, no, you don't, whatever, that's a pretty big risk that you're taking. But even if you don't believe her, she has a big old knife that she's holding up over her head. Now, of course, what the officer is going to do here at the beginning is he's going to give ground. And I know somebody's going to ask, well, why didn't he use a taser? Well, a taser is not appropriate when you don't have lethal force cover. That's a deadly force threat. And we don't force people to use non-lethal uh, defense against a lethal threat. Now, I want you to notice where he gets started here. Why was he have a gun in his hand? Because this is clearly a lethal threat at this point, And he's giving ground. Now, he's giving ground as much as he can. And, and it looks to me like he's made a decision in his mind. I'm going to give ground as long as she's just, you know, kind of walking towards me. But if 
she makes a run towards me, I'm going to have to act instead to defend my life. So he gets the gun up and on target for the impending threat. And that is absolutely reasonable for us to do. You got to recognize when there's an imminent threat that's on its way, it is utterly reasonable to have a gun out and in your hand and to know how to use it effectively to end that threat. Now he's giving ground. Going back is difficult here. You better be able to, to walk backwards. And so he's going to wait here. Now when he starts to actually use force, this point right here is where he made the decision. You got to understand in human performance, it takes about 0.5 to 0.6 seconds between when you see the threat that says deadly force is necessary here to when the trigger is pressed and the gun goes off. That's just how long it takes to process the information, make the decision, encode the action to your body, and then fire your neurons. So this is the point where the officer decided she was moving towards him. She decided to run towards him with the knife. And yes, this is suicide by cop. She's forcing the issue on him. And again, when he is threatened with deadly force, when he's threatened with a threat to his life, he has every right to defend himself. So we slow it down here, brings the gun up and puts one shot right high center chest, right in the center mass where we would teach him how to do that. That is a well-trained, well-practiced shot. So again, one of the best things we can do here, I really like the fact that he was at a low ready so he could see her hands, he could see everything about her. When, when he made the decision, when she decided to run at him, I have to defend my life. The gun comes right up into his line of sight and he gets a good, fast, accurate, single shot on target. Marksmanship skills, so incredibly important to self-defense to be able to put that shot on target. Now it's a good backstop he has right here, but it's not gonna be that way for long. And the best backstop is not pointing the gun at anybody that it doesn't need to be pointed at. Once he does that, he sees her starting to fall. So as the threat stops, the second she's down, I don't think he believed she had a gun on her, but he could see the knife. Then the knife is flying out of her hand. He stops shooting one single shot to the high center chest. Now, again, would I have blamed him for taking two or three? I certainly wouldn't have actually, but he had a little bit of distance so he could kind of evaluate his shooting a little bit and give a little bit more time and take that single shot. And because the threat stopped, he stopped shooting. That's exactly what we want to do. He's neutralized the threat. That's the goal of defensive handgun use is to neutralize the threat. Now then, why doesn't he close in on her? Well, she said she had a gun. She has the knife a ways away from her. You can see it's about 10 feet from her right there. Now, personally, I would have stepped in there. Hopefully, you know, I'd recommend that we get that knife as far away from her as possible. So if she gets back up, she doesn't have access to that knife again. But I get it. He's got a lot of things that he's trying to process all at once, get help on the way, get on the radio and all those kinds of things. So going to see here, he gets the gun back out, put it away for a moment there. Wait a minute. She could reemerge as a deadly threat. I'm going to wait for backup. I don't mind him doing that. And then they're going to try and do their best in order to render first aid to her. Unfortunately, it wasn't able to do that. So these are the unfortunate kind of situations that we do put our law enforcement officers in every day. It's one of the reasons that I respect them. I think that we got to think here about maintaining our space with a deadly tool, especially with a short range tool like a knife. I think we got to think about here the human performance factors involved when it's justified for us to use deadly force and, and what we do in the moment matters. This officer, I think, did everything that he could. He covered his ASP.